Hello, my name is Richard Felix and I'm going to take you on a ghostly tour of Edinburgh. Behind me here, the Esplanade at Edinburgh Castle. Over there, behind us and down below, Edinburgh. The crowd gathering for the one o'clock time signal. A rather loud bang that will take place any minute now. What better, what better place to start a tour of haunted Edinburgh than here at Edinburgh Castle? Stories of witches abound. There were probably more witches executed in Edinburgh than anywhere else in the country. But unlike the English, the Scots were the ones that burnt their witches and the English hanged them. With so many kings and queens being associated with this castle, so many murders and executions, no wonder Edinburgh is the most haunted place in Scotland. One of the stories to do with the castle is that of the Edinburgh Castle drummer boy, a young drummer who was often heard drumming in the middle of the night and a sentry reported the hear hearing the drums beating called out the guard nothing happened no attack came no drummer boy was seen it happened on three occasions to the same sentry he was eventually locked up for being drunk weeks later the castle was attacked and they say that it was a ghostly drummer boy trying to warn the garrison of the castle of this impending attack and they say now that the only time anyone will hear that drumming is if Edinburgh Castle is going to be attacked so settle back give me your full attention turn down the lights and let me take you on a haunted tour of Edinburgh. I'm in the Argyle Tower, and it was here on this site where Archibald Campbell, 9th Earl of Argyle, spent his last night before being executed at the Murcutt Cross for high treason. It's reported that he slept the whole night undisturbed, and the following morning was awoken from his lethargy taken in a cart down to the Mercat Cross and beheaded. And they say that his ghost still wanders around this room where he spent his last night on God's earth. But also, out through this window, we can see the gates of the castle. And in 1539, Lady Glarms was brought to the tower here and imprisoned with some of her family and an old priest. They were accused of plotting to murder King James V. They were tried for high treason and Lady Glarms was burnt at the stake on Tower Hill in front of her son and her husband. She was burnt to ashes and they say that her ghost still wanders around the castle, as do so many other ghosts. The following day, her husband tried to escape from a tower here at the castle by climbing down a rope. The rope was too short, and Lady Glam's husband crashed to his death on the rocks below Edinburgh Castle. And his ghost also wanders at the foot of the rocks of this castle to this very day. Behind me here, Edinburgh Castle. The Esplanade and Balfour Beatty taking down the seating for the Edinburgh Military Tattoo, which of course is over for another year. I'm looking for a spot on Castle Hill, 
where the burnings and the executions took place. I knew it was near to the Esplanade and I've just been in and asked the gentleman in the uh, car park office here and he said, oh yes, it's opposite Cannonball House. And he said, do you know why it's called Cannonball House? And of course I didn't. There's a cannonball in the wall just underneath the middle window. It was fired in 1745 along with many other cannonballs from the castle down into Edinburgh, firing at Bonnie Prince Charlie's soldiers who took all of Edinburgh but never managed to take the castle. He also said to me, do you know where the secret garden is? And I said, no, where is it? He said, I'm not telling you it's a secret, but actually it's just down here at the back of a place called the Witchery. So we'll go and have a look at that in a minute. But just down here is a plaque that commemorates over 300 witches that were burnt here in Edinburgh. It became the witch burning capital of Europe. And it states, this fountain is near the site on which many witches were burned at the stake. The wicked head and the serene head signify that some use their exceptional knowledge for evil purposes, while others were misunderstood and wished their kind nothing but good. The serpent has the dual significance of evil and of wisdom. Over 300 witches burnt at the stake here on this spot. No wonder this is an area of hauntings, of sightings of old ladies wandering around this area and the terrible smell of burning that people have experienced on many, many occasions around this very spot where we're standing now. Anyway, I've found the secret garden. It's here and it's actually a very fine restaurant down below. They've told me though that there is a ghost in this building on my left hand side which is, would you believe, known as the witchery. Dr Samuel Johnson actually met James Boswell here and they dined here and they tell me that on many occasions the ghost of a man wearing a tricorn hat has been seen wandering around the buildings. This is the start of the Royal Mile and many people, tourists and locals alike, have heard bagpipe music as you would in Edinburgh but coming from under the ground. Legend has it that they found a tunnel leading from one of the prison cells of the castle all the way through to Holyrood Palace and they sent a young piper down into the tunnel with his pipes playing and the soldiers walked along the top of the road listening to the music from down below listening to the skirl of the pipes as they got along the Royal Mile the pipe music got quieter and quieter until it stopped and that piper was never seen again but on a dark cold night here in Edinburgh people still hear the skirl of that boy's pipes underneath the ground. Right, well I'm literally right underneath the South Bridge in the centre of Edinburgh. With me is Fran. Hello. Fran, you are historian, storyteller, assistant director for <laughs> Mercat Tours. That's right, yes I am indeed and I've been down here many, many times before. So. Uh... Well this is my first time, so. <laughs> I'll be gentle with you. Thank you very much. Um, this is really quite something. I've never seen anything 
quite like it before. It's very um, atmospheric. Isn't what it? is it? Well, what we're actually going into now is a set of underground vaults yeah. beneath the south of the bridge. Now, they were, they were built at the same time as the bridge in the 18th century, yes. but they were divided up and used as workshops and as storage areas and as houses for people who had businesses on the bridge. So at one point there would have been maybe 100, 200 people working and living in the, down here. Down here, and it was always underground. It was never uh, uh, on street level. I see. And, and so this would be, there'd be lots and lots of houses and businesses ab above us. Mm -hmm, yep. And uh, this uh, is the lower, lowest level. Exactly. Yeah. We're about three levels below the bridge level, the street level, where all the houses and the shops are now. But underneath that is what we're, well, we're just about to go and see. Right. Do you want to lead on? Shall we? Yes, please. Let's go. It, it's so extensive. <laughs> bit of a rabbit warren, isn't it? Just a bit, yeah. I would imagine that you wouldn't send people down here on their own because they oh, quite, good Lord, no. quite easily get lost. Oh, never wander off alone. Wow. It's a labyrinth and we might find you again. And look at, look at, I mean, look at it stretching right down. There, yeah, my goodness. What's this? This is one of the largest rooms. It's actually one room on top of another room with the ceiling missing. But it gives you a very good idea of the structure of the bridge. Yeah. Because way up through that gap is the, the arch of the bridge itself. There are 19 stone arches that hold up the South Bridge. And that's what we're underneath at the moment. And that's literally up, up here. All the way up there. Wow. And the, uh, most of the vaults were built of stone, but a lot of the, uh, the ceilings were built of brick, which is quite unusual. For the, the 18th century. You know, when we, we first started coming down here on our ghost tours, we told people good, old-fashioned, traditional Edinburgh ghost stories. Yes, yeah. About six weeks after we started coming down here, somebody said this or something, and it's just gone on from there. Hardly a, a week goes by without somebody saying that they've felt or heard or seen a ghost. So you've disturbed something that's probably been lying dormant for, for, for a couple of hundred years, if you like. These rooms were closed off in about 1815, and they were right. not discovered again until a few years ago. So nearly 200 years, these rooms have been abandoned and empty. And perhaps, yes, perhaps we have, we have stirred them up a little bit. Yeah. But lots of people claim to have seen things. This is one of the more active rooms. Oh, really? Yes. Anywhere in particular? Because I do just happen to have an <laughs> EMF meter with me which of course is supposedly detects electromagnetic fields so who knows um, there's no electricity down here of course absolutely nothing so if we were to pick anything up it would be somebody's electromagnetic field but I think he's out don't think he's here today. But of course you must remember that ghosts don't appear to audiences. They don't perform on demand, do they? No. no. Very much so. But we'll try <laughs> elsewhere. You might like to try in that corner. Again. Okay. See what happens. I've never seen one of these before. It's an electromagnetic field detector. Now, for something, but I mean, it could. I mean, there are, I must be honest, there are, there's an electric cable above. Yeah. Um, so it could well be. But has anybody been seen there? Mm. Oh, yes. Oh, really? Mm. That's why I wanted to see if there was anything on there before I told you. <laughs> I'm so sneaky, aren't I? No, that's what it's all about, <laughs> really. Yes. And of course, I've never been down here before and I didn't even know it existed. No, yeah. So, and what's been seen there? There's a lady in that corner. She's really more, she's been described more as an elemental than a ghost. She's a very, a very angry, very uh, um, bitter spirit. And she's more Oof. energy than <laughs> really? she is. Really? Yes, I, I wonder. Um, and she's, she's fixed to her spot. Yes. And she makes her presence known. If somebody actually, you know, it has been known for people to stand in that corner and get, a, you know, a, 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 a jab. Um, or a shelf because she's really she's, she's been described as the most powerful spirit. Dare I do it? But she can't. She can't go anywhere. She can't move. She can't. She can't. 
she can't get out and she's very uh, she's very angry. She's not happy with you at all. So. No, I can't sense it. But as I said earlier, I don't see dead people. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Got something? Well, there's a there looks like seems to be a pit or a hole of some sort. No. Wow. Well, there's no electric power cables in here at all. There's no electric light in this room. There's no power source nearby. Can't see any cables. There's a candle, and it won't be that. Yeah. Is I mean, is this a room haunted room or? It, yes, people do claim to have seen things in here, and this was, a, we think, a caretaker or a security guard's room. Right. Um, but quite a lot of people claim to have felt or seen But I mean, there's a, there's a distinct sort of hole or... or yes, um... there is, yes. We, we think that the person who worked here um, had a, a midden. Um, oh, was, which is a rubbish tip, of course, a rubbish pit, I presume, is that right? Exactly, yep. Yeah. We found bits of broken bone and broken pot and just scraps and bits and pieces of... Well, just life, really. Somebody's yes. rubbish yeah. thrown into the corner. So someone that spent a lot of time in here, yep. lived in here almost. I would say so, given that there's a fireplace. Oh, yes, of not, course. It's not an industrial fireplace. It's not, no, it's not, is it? used for a foundry or a bread oven no, or anything. No. It's a domestic fireplace. You're right. I think somebody either lived in here or spent a lot of time uh, in this particular room. So We've had quite a lot of people claim to feel heat coming from the fireplace. Mm -hmm. um, and some people have felt it quite strongly to the point where they've had to move away from the fire because it's burning their leg. Yeah. Um, there's also, well, I would be lying if I said lots of people have seen the, mm. the guard. Mm. I think about two or three people claim to have seen a man, but a lot of people claim to have seen his little friend. Really? Um, he has a companion, uh, four legs and a tail, who runs around the vaults going, Oh, Woof. the ghost of a dog. Mm -hmm. It's a very friendly dog. It's not a very, if oh, it's a guard nice. dog, it's not a very good guard dog. Really? Um, it's very affectionate. We think it's just a, a friend, a companion, yeah. a pet. Yeah. Um, but he, he runs around the vaults, but we think he belongs in here, but he, he, he does run about all over the place. If you do feel something very... Brush past your feet. Your leg, you know, leg. Just, it's him, is it? Give it a pat, yes. I will do just that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so maybe it's him sitting in the corner, I don't Could know. be, couldn't it? Amazing, that was. No, that was right. And to the left? Yes. You lose your sense of direction. I know, that's exactly... Well, it's so big, it's so extensive that I, I sort of, you know, you'd, you'd soon get yourself lost down here, wouldn't you? We're standing in the centre of Edinburgh. This is the Mercat Cross. Um, I've heard a lot about it. It's obviously to do with um, executions and beheadings. But, Fran, can you tell me more about it? Indeed. Um, the company that I work for is called Mercat Tours oh, well. because we start all our tours at the Mercat Cross. It's really the, the traditional heart of the, the old city yes. of Edinburgh. We're standing right in the middle of the old town. Yeah. It, one of the theories as to why Edinburgh has so many ghosts is that it has so many old buildings still standing. We're very lucky that we have so many uh, old houses and medieval buildings yes. that are still here and it's said that there are, there are more ghosts here than any other place in Scotland because of that, because yep. of the age of the buildings. Uh, the, the Market Cross, as you, you quite rightly point out, was used for executions. It was, it was the marketplace. Yes. Market means the market. Yep. Uh, this is where merchants traded. It's also where they made proclamations. From the top of the cross there, the heralds would come along and da -da -da, announce the news. But the people of Edinburgh came here more than anything else to be uh, entertained and this would come in the form of punishments. For example, if you were a merchant and you'd, you'd given somebody the wrong change, you'd given them, you know, short change them, your hands would be taken and it would be nailed to the door of the Market Cross. Right. And you'd have to stand there for half an hour or the morning or two days or however uh, long your, your punishment yes, happens to yeah. be. Uh, we also have a, a story that we tell here which involves a whip uh, a cat and nine tails, to be exact. Yes. And we reenact a punishment at the Mercat Cross uh, that happened to two Englishmen uh, in the 17th century. It's a very nasty story, but you have to come out late at night to hear that. Of course. It's a bit scary. <laughs> but my favourite one uh, was the one called the Branks, 
which was a big metal brace that fitted over the head with a spike that went into your mouth. Like this. And it was reserved for nagging women. Oh yes, and we have a scold's bridle in, in England. It's very similar to the scold's bridle, that's right. Or if, if women were gossiping about their friends, then they would put them in the, in the bridle as well. And uh, the, the main, if you were obviously an ordinary peasant, yeah. the, all sorts of tortures and executions, but if you're a member of the nobility, yes. uh, you were granted the gift of having uh, your head chopped off. And this was done by the maiden, which was a, it's like a guillotine, but it had a flat blade. So it usually took about two or three goes before they finally managed oh my goodness. to sever those final difficulties. So they'd things. have to, would it be sort of hoisted similar to a guillotine, yeah. dropped, and then dropped again? and then dropped again to make... Until eventually the head would, would My be hacked off. My goodness. It was unbelievably brutal. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. So it's no wonder that, that there's, there's So many tormented those... souls, I yes, would imagine, wandering exactly. around this area. Exactly, yeah. Amazing. That is super. <laughs> Thank you. I'm leaving the Mercat's Cross behind. I'm walking down the Royal Mile. I'm heading towards a street called Bell's Wind. There's a rather interesting and quite frightening ghost story to do with a house down here. So come with me down the alleyway while we tell the story of George Gourlay and his wife Christian. They lived in a tenemented house down here in Bell's Wind. They lived there for 21 years. And the whole time that they were there, next door to them, there was a house boarded up and shuttered. George was always fascinated by that house. And being a blacksmith and an accomplished locksmith as well, George had always planned to break into the house to see what secrets it held. One night, when his wife Christian was asleep, George left the house with his keys and his tools to break into the house next door. Being a good locksmith, he soon opened the door and was in. He went into the house and he could smell decay and death all around him. It was very dark. He'd only got a candle. He lit the candle and ventured in. There were four rooms off the hallway, all with the doors closed. He went into the first room and there was a kitchen. Everything was left just as it had been 21 years ago. There was the skeleton of a goose still hanging on the spit. A meal had been prepared. He left the kitchen and went into the dining room. The dining room table was set with wine glasses and claret still on the table. Dust and cobwebs everywhere. He went into another room, opened the door of the bedroom. And as he got in there, an icy chill hit him. There was a large four-poster bed with curtains. The curtain moved. George stepped back and the ghostly figure of a woman came out from the curtains across the room past George and his candle went out. He panicked. He ran back into the hall. The ghost disappeared. George fumbled with matches and managed to light the candle again. He was determined to see this thing through, although he was terrified. He crept back into the bedroom, went to the four-poster bed, drew back the curtains, and there to his shock and horror was a skeleton lying on the bed, its mouth open in the agonies of its death. It was wearing a white nightdress. George decided it was time to leave the house. He went back home, climbed into his bed, and the following morning told his wife, Christian, 
what had happened the night before. George fetched the police. And it was only then that his wife had to admit to George that she knew all about the story. She knew who lived there. It was a Mr. and Mrs. Guthrie. George's wife, Christian, when she was a teenager, had actually been the maidservant. And it was Christian who prepared that fateful meal that night. And apparently, the Guthrie family who lived there, Mr. Guthrie, was actually seeing another woman. And George was told by his wife that Mr. Guthrie murdered his wife in the bed and left. No one knows what happened to Mr. Guthrie, but after all those years, they found the skeleton of his wife and she was given a decent burial and her ghost was never seen again. I'm not sure which house it was, but here's an old 18th century tenemented house in Bellswind with a rather interesting bricked up doorway. Who knows if this is the very door that George entered through to have that horrendous experience of that ghost on that fateful night over 200 years ago. And a welcome stop on the way on the Royal Mile. I'm in the, the Mitre. It's a public house that stands on the site of Bishop Spottiswood's tenemented house here. He was the Bishop of St Andrews and had this fine house built here in 1615. It's got ghosts. It's a possibility that the Bishop is very unhappy because his house was demolished. This house was built and of course it's been turned into a den of iniquity. It's a public house and restaurant. Even in the menu of the Mitre is the story of the ghostly goings on. It happens mostly around the staircase and on the stairs to the cellars and staff report that there's always an icy chill as if they're not alone when they're going down the stairs and an incident that happened when two members of staff were actually in the cellar changing beer barrels. The place was actually closed and for absolutely no reason at all the jukebox came on. For no reason at all. It was very loud. They came upstairs to see who was here, who'd done it. And of course the place was shut up, there was nobody around. So they switched it off and went back downstairs, carried on with their work. And of course, you know what I'm going to say, it came on again. They came back upstairs, still nobody there. And so they beat a hasty retreat until the landlord arrived. This is Greyfriars Churchyard. This is one of the most incredible graveyards I've ever seen in my life. It was laid down in 1560 and so contains some of the most incredible gravestones. Certainly in Scotland, but I must be honest with you, I've never seen gravestone like this anywhere in this country. It's something very special. This has been a scene of body snatching witches, burials, paganism and the church was actually built in 1620 and in 1638 the National Covenant was actually signed inside that church. It's always been a place 
of hauntings and of ghosts. But in 1998, a very strange phenomenon started when people walking through the graveyard were attacked by unseen hands. People were pushed over, people were bruised, people were scratched, and in fact, 24 people in all were actually knocked unconscious in this graveyard. A lot of psychical research was done and the entity that was causing it was labelled the Mackenzie Poltergeist. The houses around the graveyard were also disturbed by this poltergeist. Stones and bricks were thrown at the walls and vast amounts of pottery, old-fashioned pottery, were also thrown at the houses. Two exorcisms were done here and the actual area where that poltergeist activity took place, even now, is actually chained off. Now, I find it strange that there should be such poltergeist activity in a churchyard, because although they appear to be spooky places, and when you look at some of the emblems on the walls and on some of the gravestones, you can understand why they are spooky. But to be honest with you, graveyards aren't usually the most haunted places. It's said that the first person to be buried in a graveyard comes back as a ghost to protect all the other souls and spirits in that graveyard. But again, it's not usually poltergeist activity because poltergeists are usually energy forces using the mind of a living person, the energy of a person, usually children, especially girls reaching puberty. So why this graveyard should have been so haunted by the Mackenzie poltergeist, no one really knows. And this is the area where all the psychic energy, the poltergeist activity tends to emanate from. This was the old Covenanters prison and was the area where they were imprisoned actually here in this churchyard. Up on the wall here, a coffin and behind it the tools of the sexton, the man that dug the graves. And inside here you can actually see the walls of the houses where the stones, the bricks and the pottery was thrown against it and it's actually got gravestones and monuments on it. It's locked, as you can see. I'm quite glad really, because I don't really think I'd like to go in there. It's not so bad in the daytime. I certainly wouldn't like to do it at night. But just before we leave this place, there's an even more important story. The story of Greyfriars Bobby, a little shepherd dog. So let's go and find his master's grave before we leave. And while we're in Greyfriars Churchyard, a very haunting story. The story of Greyfriars Bobby, a little sheepdog, belonged to John Gray. He was a shepherd and he died in 1858 and for 14 years that shepherd's little dog kept a vigil here by his gravestone until eventually in 1972 the broken-hearted little dog died and is buried obviously not in the churchyard but very close by. I'm standing next to Deacon Brodie. He's a very famous Edinburgh personality. This is all that's left of his house. This is Brodie's Close. 
Deacon Brodie by daytime was a respectable carpenter and honorary deacon of rights. His father had been deacon before him. This was where his workshop was. This is where he lived. But at night time, there was another side to him. He was a burglar. He was not making enough money. And he formed a band of robbers known as the Brody Gang. They terrorized the community in Edinburgh until one day they robbed the Customs and Excise Office. That was too much. The government came after them and captured them. Brody was sentenced to be hanged at the toll booth. He was hanged on his own gallows, the gallows that he'd designed himself and created here in his workshop. Before he was actually hanged, he had bribed the hangman to make the rope smaller than it should be. He had also had a silver pipe inserted in his windpipe to stop him from choking. And he'd had a metal collar put around his neck to stop the jolt of the rope from breaking his neck. But despite all of those things, Deacon Brodie was taken down from the rope, dead. His last resort was to pay a French surgeon to be waiting here in his workshop. Brodie was thrown into a cart and rushed round here, laid on a table, and the surgeon bled certain parts of his body to try and revive him. But it was all to no avail. Brodie was dead. But his spirit lives on in the story of Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, written by Robert Louis Stevenson, and based on the very man that lived here, Deacon Brodie. There is also another story that 12 years later, a parson walking along the Royal Mile actually saw Deacon Brodie and that letter is still preserved to this very day. Did Deacon Brodie live? Did that parson really see him? Or did he see his spirit wandering along the Royal Mile? We'll never know. And there is a much more up-to-date story here as well. Upstairs here is the Celtic Lodge, a Freemasonry Lodge. And there was for many years a gentleman who was caretaker here. One night, two of the Masons going into the toilets, and it's surprising actually how many stories there are to do with toilets. I don't know whether it's to do with strain, water, ectoplasm or what, but an awful lot of stories are connected with toilets. These two gentlemen were standing at the urinals when the caretaker walked past them. They actually saw him in the mirror. Both of them turned, both of them spoke to him and he spoke back. They went back down to their lodge meeting and just in passing mentioned that they'd seen John, the caretaker, in the toilets. But they were told, much to their horror, that that was impossible. John died three days earlier. And I'm sitting in a very pleasant little tea room, which is originally Deacon Brodie's workshop. It was actually in here that he designed and built the gallows that he was hanged on. And of course, this is the room that his body was brought back into to be bled. I'm looking at Holyrood House, the end of the Royal Mile, the other end, a rather wet end, and the wet end to a day. A horrendous murder took place in there in 1566. Mary, Queen of Scots, was paying rather a lot of attention to her young Italian secretary, David Rizzio. Her husband 
Lord Darnley was very jealous, and one night he burst into Mary's apartments while Rizzio was there with some of his nobles, and he stabbed the young Italian to death. They stabbed him at least 30 times, and then threw his body down the stairs. He bled so much that it soaked into the wood on the floor, and despite successive attempts to remove those bloodstains, they kept reappearing, and those bloodstains keep reappearing to this very day. Within a year of that incident, Darnley also was dead. He developed smallpox and moved out of the palace and was living in a house at Kirker Field. One night, the house was blown up, and the following morning, Darnley's body was found strangled in the garden and Mary was blamed for the murder of her husband. And they say that to this very day, in the rooms that Darnley occupied, people, including visitors, see strange shadows moving across the oak panelling. And they say that it's the restless spirit of Lord Darnley, murdered by no less than Mary, Queen of Scots, I'm sitting in the departure lounge of uh, Edinburgh Airport. Just finished filming for the day and uh, I'm on my way back to Derby. There's been a delay. Um, I've been chatting to one or two people here, the security people. A uh, chap asked me what we were doing. We got cameras and why I was dressed like this. And I explained to them that we were doing a, a video on ghosts of Edinburgh. And he said, uh, did you know we'd got a ghost here in the airport? which I, I, I didn't know anything about. And apparently they've got a poltergeist here. Things move, things disappear, and then reappear, sometimes weeks later. Apparently it's very fond of the yellow jackets, and they go missing and then appear in rather strange places. And the cleaners don't like working on their own at night. They prefer to work in pairs. Now, I, I don't know what the ghost is. I, I don't actually know whether this was an old airfield during the war. I, I have no idea, but all I know after speaking to these security men that there is a ghost here. In fact, a modern ghost here at Edinburgh Airport. Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment, and of course death. And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series, but I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight 
out of ten ghost stories can be explained. But it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares. Thank you.